join us in the aforementioned Michael Carl as well. And we kick off the show this morning with the uh, treasurer of the state of West Virginia, congressional candidate Riley Moore. Riley, good morning to you. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Doing well. Uh, pretty swell here in the uh, eastern panhandle. Were you home this weekend or are you, were you traveling the state? I uh, was traveling the state, um, and so just uh, got back from Parkersburg. So, uh, yeah, just on the road, on the road, on the road. So it's a good uh, time to point out when you are a state elected official, but you're also running for office, how you have to balance the time and report from a functional standpoint use of of course, your salary is taxpayer funded. So how do you balance campaigning for a different office with doing your job that the taxpayers are paying you to do time wise? Well, you know, a lot of the political uh, events that I do are generally tend to be after hours. And so do my job, uh, then go do kind of the political functions in the evening and uh, then move on to the next place. Or we'll do it uh, perhaps sometimes in the morning. But, uh, you know, look, the beat goes on in the treasurer's office, and we're working hard, and we've rolled out some new uh, some new things here in the treasurer's office. Just recently um, I asked for the Board of Treasury Investment, uh, which manages uh, – or, pardon me, the College Savings Board, which manages our – our College 529 savings plan um, to adopt a new fund uh, that gets us out of all Chinese investment. Now, I don't want to get too technical and down in the weeds, but they have these funds called emerging market funds. And generally, there is exposure to China in that. And we as a board, and I put the proposal together, said, look, I see a lot of financial risk in the long term on this, and we had uh, been able to prove out with one of our um, vendors that we could actually make more money by not investing in China, and we just adopted that uh, this week and um, made it official yesterday. So we're still working hard in there. Riley, is there, are there any other countries besides China that you're uh, going to exclude Yemen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, there, there, there's not too much to invest in in Yemen. Uh, <laughs> so it's, you know, I, I think a, an interesting example in this would be um, when you had uh, when Russia invaded Ukraine, right? So there were emerging market funds that had exposure to uh, Russian companies like Gazprom or this or that. Um, and we saw some of that around the country. And then those turned into vapor, zero. I mean, they were just pieces of paper. People lost um, considerable money. But, you know, you get, I get worried about the same thing with China because you're kind of at the, at the whims of one man over there, Xi Jinping, who can decide, you know, Okay, you know what? Actually, this company's not going to go public. I've changed my mind. They they are not allowed to have a public offering, or we're going to invade Taiwan, or we're going to do this. So for us, we feel like in the long term, because these are kind of long-term savings programs, um, not having that exposure, I think, is probably the best thing for us. So going back to the question, are there any, any other countries that you uh, uh, you have concerns about besides China that falls in the same category that you just mentioned? Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, somebody said something about Yemen. No, no. Uh, no. <laughs> that was our host, Who, Ronnie. Who's, who's that idiot distracting <laughs> the treasure? <laughs> the one that has the mute button. It keeps, it keeps Mike hiding myself. I thought we should shut that guy up. <laughs> sorry, the Yemen thing got me off track. Yeah, no, no, there's, there's, there's no other ones that we have concerns about. Okay. Mr. Height. Riley, let's, let's talk a little bit about your campaign. And, and usually when um, when you have individuals campaigning, um, especially in the primary, you have to distinguish yourself from uh, another Republican, another conservative. So if you could elaborate on what makes Riley more different and better um, for the, the congressional seat. Well, that's a great question. And so what really distinguishes me is that I'm a proven conservative, right? I, I'm not just 
standing up there giving a speech about what I'm going to do if I'm elected to Congress and what I could do. I got a record, and you can go back and look at that record. You can look at my voting record. I had one of the most conservative voting records when I was in the state legislature. We have made a lot of uh, uh, progress in the treasurer's office pushing back on what some call and, uh, you know, kind of general term these days, kind of woke corporations, but really it's pushing back on that environmental uh, social governance movement, ESG, and uh, protecting our tax dollars, also protecting the Second Amendment. We were able to pass that credit card bill. Thank you, uh, Mike, for your vote on that, which prohibited uh, banks and credit card companies from tracking purchases of guns and ammunition, or uh, from tracking the purchase of guns and ammunition here in the state of West Virginia and actually the country. And, uh, you know, we've been real good stewards of the, t- of the taxpayer dollars. Uh, we've brought, you know, two new programs on, like Jumpstart, which I'd love to make a national program, Hope Scholarship, which is another great program that I'd love to see actually as a national program, school choice in this country. So I got the record. I have the experience, and, you know, if you're looking for a proven conservative fighter, then I'm your guy. I want to read a comment to you that's on our Facebook page from a military veteran, Riley, and it references a a scenario in Romney recently, which I also want to ask you about because uh, that's uh, come out a couple different ways in regards to how that's been reported. Uh, William Whittington writes, uh, this guy, meaning Riley Moore, lost me when he attacked his opponent's military service. General Walker, and just recently failed to apologize to Walker in Romney during a candidate event. Instead, he further I, expanded I, his attack. In Romney? In Romney. I wasn't in Romney. Yeah. I wasn't in Romney. Well, where, um, where was it? Maybe, maybe I think of Hampshire County. Hampshire um, County. So let, let me make something clear. I've never attacked his record. I have never said anything about his record. Ever. I've never said anything. I've never been on your program or any, like, attacking his military record. That's never happened. I've never done that. That's not something I would do. He says you have, and he's, in fact, built quite a publicity campaign saying that you have attacked his military record. There have been no comments by you regarding his military record? No. None. Zero. Zero. What uh, I think what he is referencing is that there were two consultants on Twitter, of all places, commenting about me and him and I, you know somebody i guess said something that he didn't like some political consultant or something like that that's not me that- I, you know I've, I've not made a statement i've not um um put out a press release i've never said anything about his military record and that is unfortunately that is a lie that riley moore has said something about his military record i'd love that facebook commenter if i did show me where i did give me the evidence where did i say something we're talking about two guys on twitter come on let, let, let's be grown-ups here <laughs> this is i mean you all been interviewing me and we've known each other for 10 years mm-hmm. you ever heard me say something about somebody's military record i mean that's ridiculous no uh now in regards to that appearance in uh in hampshire county uh the next day General Walker's people sent out a press release saying that you were you melted down during a time when the general was talking in terms of your objections and and uh, feeling that uh, you were being misrepresented with what the general was saying. This is how it's filtered back to me from other people as well. Do, do you regard your behavior as being a meltdown on your part while General Walker was talking? No, no. I just said, that's a lie. Show me where I said that. And you know what he said? I'm not saying you said that. I'm saying that somebody who, um, what do you say, somebody who works on your campaign or associated with your campaign said that. I'm like, so you're saying I'm not, I didn't say that? He's like, I'm not saying you said that. Hmm. Well, that's interesting because they have put out press, and I get all the press. They have put out press that say, that says you, Riley Moore, attacked General Mookie Walker's military service. And as a result of that, there are, 
other, I guess, service organizations, military service organizations that have come to his defense and criticized you for it. But you're saying you've never uttered any critical comments about his military service. I know you've never done it on this show and we've asked you about it, but according to them, you have. Yeah, I'd love for them to point out where I said that. That, that I mean, I guess anybody can say whatever they want (laughs) and say, hey, he said that would, that would it. solve everything. If you have the evidence, then bring forth the evidence. Uh, if not, then then quit saying it. Uh, I, that, that kind of stuff irritates me as well. If you have evidence that somebody's done something, then show the evidence. Just don't, just don't say it. Well, this is the first time that I've heard, if, if what you say is true, Riley, that General Walker said, I'm not saying that you, Riley Moore, said it directly, but somebody associated with you did. That's, if I remember reading these releases correctly, that's not what those releases say. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I was yeah. going. Excuse me. Go ahead, Riley. Finish. Oh no, no, please go ahead. Yeah, I was going to change the subject. Some uh, change the subject. I go into another political race, and I don't know if you if you want to comment at all. But uh, Governor Justice yesterday came out and uh, endorsed more Capito. Uh, do you think that that endor- that endorsement is going to have a bearing on the race for the governor? Um, you know, I don't know. Uh, it could, but you know, I. I I think we all kind of get a little spun up on endorsements sometimes, like what they're going to do or not do. I, I think it's kind of hard to tell. Now, I know, that, I mean, look, there's one guy's endorsement that certainly does have a tremendous amount of weight, and that's President Donald Trump. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, You know, I've been hearing for a little while that this was coming out and um, wasn't sure if it was going to or not. But, yeah, look, uh, now it's come out. Um, it certainly doesn't hurt. That's for sure. Yeah, it does not hurt, and I think it depends on part of the uh, the state. I, I understand uh, justice is very, very, very popular in the south, southern part of the state, probably less so in the eastern panhandle. So I suspect the weight of the endorsement would depend upon what part of the state you're from. Yeah, I think that's probably right. Riley, I, I'd agree with that statement. Riley, let's let's get back to your your campaign as well. So. What I'd like to know is right now you have run for uh, either regional or statewide races um, up to this point, and now you're running for to represent the state of West Virginia nationally. So talk a little bit about the the issues that you see being uh, much different than what you're dealing with now or in the past. You know, going down there and just kind of talking with some of these folks, it's uh, been pretty fascinating <laughs> where, you know, you can generally, I mean, I'm a West Virginian, I'm born here, you know, and, and you can really talk to anybody, you know, whether Democrat, Republican, what have you. The Democrats down there, they are like out of their minds. <laughs> like, I, I, there, there is no, there's nothing really you can talk to these folks about. I, you know, it's hard to find common ground. Uh, I would say really on anything with them, but I, you know, for me, look, we're a small state, but, you know, we're a state that has done tremendous things as it relates to our outputs and our contributions to this country. And I think that's something that needs to be respected on that stage down there. And I think it's something that they need to understand the types of industries, the types of things that we do here. Obviously, I'm talking about the fossil fuel industry, but I'm also talking about some of the innovations that we're also uh, undertaking here in the state of West Virginia. And, um, you know, that's something that I don't think necessarily always comes through, particularly there in the House. And, look, I'm not somebody who's going to let us just get run over, uh, particularly by bureaucrats in Washington, D.C., that are trying to kill some of our critical industries, such as coal, gas, and oil, which is important to us. Look, we have 350 years of coal left in West Virginia, and they're acting like this is dying. I was just at a coal mine last week, and they are, as quickly as they are producing it, they are shipping it. And I do want to point something out, and this is contrary to the media narrative. The world last year burned more coal than any time in human history because Indonesia is building new coal-fired power plants. So is China. So is India. And their energy consumption rates continue to climb. Why are they burning? You know, we want them burning West Virginia coal. And I was in um, Moundsville coal mine up there 
And that's where a lot of this coal is going. I mean, you're talking spot price on it right now going to Asia, 250 bucks a ton. I mean, th- this is an industry to me that is, it is absolutely not dying. It is thriving if our government will just get out of the way and let it happen. Nope. Yeah. Uh, Riley, uh, a, a political philosophical question. It was not long mm. ago that most bills, and I'm talking about the, uh, the House of Representatives now in, in D.C., most bills could find bipartisan support, and that's the way government ran, on compromise and getting the best ideas from both parties. Now the impression that I have, and looking at sec- uh, Speaker Johnson trying to get, uh, that he may have to work with the, uh, the, the Democrats, he's been accused of making a pact with the devil, even, talk, even the thought of sitting down and talking with a Democrat. What is your view on this? Is this something we need to actually seek compromise? Or if you reach across the aisle and start talking to the other party, uh, it's not only the acceptable thing to do, it's the appropriate thing to do? Uh, To me, I mean, particularly where the Democrats stand a lot of things nationally, I don't think there's too much to talk about, to be honest with you. Um, I I, I don't. Um, But first and foremost, he is a Speaker of the House, but he is also the leader of the Republican conference in the House. And the House is majority rule. That is the way that body works. It is not the United States Senate. And so to me, you know, you really need to be representing the equities and interests of the conference first and foremost, because you have been elected by popular vote to reflect the uh, electorate here in the United States through direct elections. And they want the Republicans in charge. They put the Republicans in charge because they want Republican policies to pass that chamber. Riley Moore, our guest here on the program, treasurer of the state of West Virginia, candidate for Congress. Uh, Larry Pack right now is uh, the only candidate I see who's on the ballot for treasurer in the upcoming he Republican is, primary. He's got, got an easy one. Yeah. <laughs> he's got, he got a layup. Got a, hey, R- Riley, I want, I want to circle back to where I started with you for a moment because I looked up these emails, and they do, in their defense, refer to the attacks on the general's service record as coming from Riley Moore's campaign. It doesn't say directly that you made those attacks. And they reference a tweet which traces back to a Luke Thompson. Does that name mean anything to you? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he works on my campaign, a whole bunch of other campaigns around the country. I mean, I, so if you're saying my campaign said, show me where my campaign put out a statement. I mean, look, I can't control every person who is under contract on, you know, my campaign or a whole bunch of other campaigns out here in the country, what they're saying on their personal Twitter account. I mean, you show me where my campaign said something. Now, one of the things, and, and we interviewed you since you first ran for local delegate in Jefferson County yep. a dozen years ago. And that was something that you did not shy away from telling anybody. And that was when you worked for the Podesta group. Now, this was not uh, John Podesta directly. I understand this was his brother. Uh, but you had spent time in D.C. working for the Podesta group. And they have uh, the, the Walker campaign has pointed out some of your lobbying record for the Podesta group, which uh, they're I think in the way the way it's worded effectively, if I can summarize, doesn't represent West Virginia values. Can you tell us about your work with the Podesta group? This guy wouldn't know West Virginia values if it hit him in the face. He's from New York City, first of all. <laughs> Secondly, he doesn't even live in the district. I want to highlight that. He doesn't live in the district. He lives in Charleston. He has never voted in the district. You can look that up. Never cast a vote. In this district, doesn't live in the district. He has, li- you know, quote unquote, lived here. I guess he's got a PO box here or something like that. He's been here for seven minutes. I've been here for seven generations. You're not going to tell me about West Virginia values. I know what West Virginia values are. This guy's going to have to Google it, I guess, to figure it out, or you know, get on Google Maps to figure out where the, even the district is or his polling location. It, it, it it's ridiculous. And you know, look, these are the same attacks. As you just mentioned, that Democrats have brought up previously, and now we just got another Democrat bringing it back up. 
and I'm going to talk about this guy because it's not worth the time and effort, but y'all go take a look at this, what he had done, you know, just as of recently. He was the head of diversity, equity, and inclusion for the Air Guard, DEI, trying to put in more diverse pilots. So basing it on race and gender, who's going to fly a commercial airplane instead of qualification? Is that making people safer? I don't think so. And you might say, well, I'm following orders and I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. Then he goes on a speaking tour about that same issue and was doing it in the private sector as well. So you tell me. Now, I don't need to get all on his stuff because he certainly doesn't even know where Martinsburg is. But (laughs) I'm going to tell you, look, don't be fooled by this. This is all just smoke and mirrors and nonsense. Yeah, Raleigh, you, by all indications, you have a commanding lead for in this race. Uh, probably, uh, I, my suspicions are you're going to win it ha- uh, hands down. Why do you need to get involved at all in point to counterpoint? Well, for one, I asked him about it. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. yeah. The que- you had to answer the question. Yeah. Bill, if you're, if, you're, if you're trying to devalue me here in the program, I, that's a great question. Otherwise, <laughs> forget it, Riley. The question's been answered. Yeah. Right. Riley, why are you answering I mean, Rob's questions? Yeah, yeah. why are I you? Mean, look, generally, I get on here and talk about my campaign. I don't talk about any of my opponents. I'm just trying to bring you know, forward my positive message on all this you know, and why I'm running and why I think I'm the best candidate. I generally don't. I don't need to get into all this, you know, made up. Riley said something about me when I didn't even say anything. You know, look, I, I just generally stick to why I think I'm the best candidate. I'm the proven conservative candidate in this race, and I got the record for it. So, um, yeah, and I get it. You know, they they want to sling some mud and all this, and it's free country. You can do that. But we're going to find out here in 25 days, and I don't think they're going to like the results. Yeah. We are uh, just a boot out of time. Uh, Riley, in regards to the Treasurer's Office and the Hope Scholarship, is there any other new news you need to bring to the attention of our audience? Not totally new, but I do want people to be aware of this. We have a complete open enrollment on this. We've talked about this before, but you can now apply year-round. But just for people's kind of calendars here, to get the full Hope Scholarship, you have to apply by June 15th. Then it will go prorated from there, and, you know, then you get 75%. Then throughout the year, then you go to 50, 25, so on and so forth. But to get 100% funding, which is $5,000 in this next academic year, June 15th, you got to apply by then, okay? Riley, thank you very much for your time this morning. Much appreciated. Oh, thank you all so much. Good talking to you, Thanks, Riley. Riley. You too. See you Treasurer Riley Moore, candidate for Congress. Bill, give me a list of questions you don't want me to ask the next uh, guest that we have. I'll be sure to pay attention.